protests and hunger strikes have dominated the news for weeks, coming to a head on Friday with demonstrations on Parliament Hill led by some Aboriginal leaders, even as other leaders were meeting with the Prime Minister. Why do these issues matter, and why is it so difficult to find lasting solutions? For a bit of context, here's your weekly West Block Primer. First Nations, as the name suggests, were here first. That is the foundation of their negotiations for land, rights and justice. Non-Aboriginals are here in greater numbers. That has given them more political power in negotiations. The Constitution in 1982 affirmed inherent Aboriginal treaty rights. But in 1996, the Royal Commission slammed the Canadian government's record, saying its policy direction over the last 150 years has been wrong. Why is this all such a big deal in Canada now? First, there are 1.2 million Aboriginal people, almost 4% of Canada's population. That's the second highest per capita Aboriginal population in the industrialized world. So, the issue is large in this country. The Aboriginal unemployment rate is almost three times the national average. By every important social measure, poverty, health, education, housing, Aboriginal life is unacceptably low. So the problems are real in this country. The Aboriginal population is young and growing six times faster than the rest of Canada. The median age for non-Aboriginals is 40. For Aboriginal people, it's 27. In short, Aboriginal people are here to stay in this country. It's becoming clear. They're here, they're young, they're restless, and they're not going anywhere. The message to the rest of Canada is not get used to it, but deal with it. Well, dealing with it is exactly what some First Nations chiefs tried to do on Friday. While some chiefs joined the Prime Minister for a working meeting, others from Manitoba and Ontario boycotted it, demanding that the Governor-General be at the table. The GG did host chiefs at his residence Friday night, but Chief Teresa Spence, who has been at the centre of this, says that's not good enough. So she is continuing with her liquids-only hunger protest. Chiefs like Matthew Kuncum of Quebec did attend the meeting with the Prime Minister and would like to see a less emphasis on hunger strikes and more emphasis on dialogue that can lead to results. And joining us now, Matthew Kuncum, the Grand Chief of the Northern Quebec and James Bay Cree. Chief, it is great to have you here because you have been on the front lines from uh, national stage uh, to the street protests all through your life, so it's, it's important, I think, that we get your perspective. You were in there with the Prime Minister. This is a very long meeting. Did you, did you have a sense that he was changing? Have we seen something different? I believe that the, a goalpost has been moved. If you want to resolve and produce results and major changes, we need to, to, to fix the impasse. And the Prime Minister said there will be a high-level uh, dialogue. And there will be an oversight by the Prime Minister's office and the Privy Council. So, so, so we have the Prime Minister there, and I think and I think it's an opportunity. I think the onus is now on the leadership to be able to make very clear as to what the impasse is and make recommendations and seek solutions and so that we can all move forward. We're not used to seeing the Prime Minister blink. He held the meeting. He stayed at the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, they're coming forward with, uh, with, with um, offers of, you know, things that can be done immediately. Do you, do you have a sense in that uh, what the best thing was that came out of the meeting? It, the best thing that I believe that came out of the we meeting is that there's still a door open. There is still an opportunity. If we are, if we are to see that the protest stop, we have to see results. We have to see a change. We have to see a shift in the government where the government's tackle and willing to address those issues that we, we, that we are concerned about, whether it be treaties, specific land claims, uh, resource revenue, and, that, and he's willing to entertain those and look at them. So there's a, an opportunity that is there, and I think the only way to move forward is to be able to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the Prime Minister, put our demands on the table, this is our solutions, and now, now let's talk. You were at the meeting. Other AFN chiefs decided not to be there. What do you say to them in the wake of having been there and achieved something? Well, I have been in protests. I have filed major court cases. I've been involved in the international community. I never went on a hunger strike. But at the end of the day, we all have to talk. The, the, the relationship is broken, and we need to fix it. And we need to produce results so that, so that those protests will stop. And we need to find a way of how we can build and maintain and fix that crown federal relationship and hopefully save a life along the way. At the end of the day, it seemed to come down to the governor general not being in the room. 
Why was that not a deal breaker for you? Well, well personally, I, I think there's a misunderstanding on the role of the Governor General. The, the constitution of this country was patriated, and the executive powers were given to the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister will not give uh, transfers the executive powers to the, to the Governor General. So it's just a symbolic. Uh, do you support the hunger strike, or do you think that uh, she should stop that now? Each person must decide what they think they need to do to raise the issues. Uh, I think she should stop her hunger strike because she already had met with the Governor General. There's already a, a meeting with, uh, with the Prime Minister. She may or may not have participated, but that is fine. That is what she wanted. She should declare victory. I think uh, she has an opportunity. She, she has, and I think she may have lost it, an opportunity to declare victory. There is some kind of movement happening, though, outside the table around which even the Prime Minister meets, the idle no more protests. We're hearing this week that uh, that could be ramped up and there could be blockades. Uh, where do you come down on the type of protests? Because you've protested in the past. Mm -hmm. What's appropriate, what's not? I've always said that there is a social time bomb of frustration, anger, and hopelessness. And there will be a social unrest when you do not have a meaningful and an effective process where there's concrete results. If there's results, there will be uh, uh, no protest. Now, people have the right in this country to be able to uh, express uh, their feelings and demonstrate if they want to. But I think it's, it's not right to be able to try to, to uh, block uh, and try to affect the economy. I think there's other ways to do it. Uh, I, th I have no problem with protesters. I think uh, we should do both. I think people should be uh, uh, do peaceful protests. At the same time, people should be on the inside talking to the Prime Minister. Matthew Kuhn, come. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. And joining us now, Regional Chief for, uh, from Saskatchewan, Perry Bellegarde, who was not at the meeting with the Prime Minister. So what did you gain by not being there? Well, not being there, like we, we said in our, in our caucus, that it's more important to, to meet with the Queen's representative first and the Crown's representative, because we have a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the Crown. So was that, uh, you know, Matthew Kuhn come, uh, Chief Atlio, they say that uh, good came from this meeting. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Anything that you can bring about transformative change and build upon a relationship, we say it's positive. But we really got to make it work, transformational change. Because every time we meet with Minister of Indian Affairs, you know, and our government, they say, we have no mandate to implement treaty. We have no mandate to give legal effect to Section 35 and enforce that. And so if we have a process, and that was the process and mandate or commitment we wanted to seek from the Prime Minister at the highest level, involvement from the Prime Minister's office, Privy Council office, you know, to look at enforcement and implementation of treaty and inherent rights. Now let's work on that. Let's get that started. Let me ask you about the rift that we see within the Assembly of First Nations. Uh, Chief Atlio and others were inside. You were on the outside. Uh, you are a potential linchpin at this moment mm -hmm. for either bringing this back together or entrenching that split. Do you support Chief Atlio? Of course. We cannot be divided. We cannot spread our energies across Canada and be worried about that divisiveness because to me there is none. We're collectively in this together and united we've got to stand. The, uh, there are protests coming up this week. Do you support the protests? Do you support protests that might blockade? Uh, roads, railways. We always support anything that will bring about positive transformative change. We support processes that move things forward and educate the public that things have to change because we're tired of poverty. You know, when we, we, we don't, I couldn't call them blockades. You know, I I'll always call things unifying rallies. And education awareness, leads to understanding it, leads to action. And so what you're seeing when you see this, this talk about uh, destabilizing the economy, Mm -hmm. It's the frustration level that's there, that's been building for many, many years because we've been marginalized from economic development. And our people are tired of the lands and resources being exploited with nothing coming back to our people because poverty is the issue. Like our people are frustrated. You know, when in a country as rich as Canada, you know, in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the United Nations Human Development Index, Canada is rated sixth. For Indigenous peoples, we're 63rd. Yes. And, and that's not acceptable. And so when you see a movement like that, it's about bringing positive, constructive change. And, and so, and if a blockade becomes a part of that to achieve something better, then so be it. We always say we do things in a respectful way, in a peaceful way, you know. And we say it should not have to take those blockades to raise people's eyes, to raise people's awareness. Shouldn't, it should not have to come no. to that, you know. And so we always say there's three strategies that have to collectively be done. The legal fight and the legal strategy, 
you know, mm -hmm. uh, against the uh, government bills that unilaterally imposed. The political strategy, which we have now with the Prime Minister's commitment and Cabinet's commitment, and as well political activism. Mm -hmm. All three things have to be done collectively so that we can work in unison and bring about change in all fronts. All right. Perry Belgard, thank you for talking to us today. You're very welcome, Eric. Coming out of Friday's meeting with the Prime Minister, some chiefs say it was successful, others aren't so sure. Today, the government is announcing how it'll spend the $330 million promised in last year's budget for water and wastewater management on reserves. It's not part of the demands made by Aboriginal leaders on Friday, but it does appear to be a gesture of good faith. And joining us now is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, Greg Rickford. Uh, Good morning. Fair to say, uh, Mr. Rickford, that the timing of this is meant to be as a sincere gesture, but that it needs to go further, that, uh, that there's a need for more money. And do all of these protests help you in your department get more out of the government now? Well, let me try and unpack that question. First of all, with respect to water and wastewater treatment, this was part of uh, Canada's Economic Action Plan version 2012. Uh, we had uh, obviously engaged in a thoroughly consultative process with the Assembly of First Nations coast to coast to coast, meeting with technical experts, community members, uh, and uh, uh, the department uh, on matters of, uh, you know, the kind of infrastructure that would be required, the kind of capacity and the kind of legislation. What we came up with briefly was capacity, the ability to report, monitor and maintain facilities, an ongoing need for infrastructure and a piece of legislation that the federal government and First Nations communities could adhere to uh, so that they would have the same wa water quality standards as other Canadians have come and, to expect. And if that's a sincere first step, yeah. what next? Like, because there are very big issues here. Does it need more money, in your view? And does and do these protests give you the opportunity to say, look what's happening yeah. to other departments, we do need something more? Eric, it's not just a question of resources. We, we understand uh, that there are structural challenges out there that we need to uh, move through some kind of process. If, if Friday's meeting means a couple of important things, it's a dialogue around uh, land claims and treaties, the ability to have uh, more political oversight in these regards. Uh, and move them forward towards certainty, finality, and a positive impact on the key part of this, exactly what First Nation Canadians are asking for as other Canadians, jobs and sustainable communities. And we're putting the focus on that. And I think Friday we made some significant progress in those regards. Even chiefs who had said, uh, you know, may have guardedly optimistic at best and may not have been at the meetings have had positive comments about where this could go. One of the big areas where they're worried that they're not making enough progress are on these uh, omnibus bills where it involves uh, land or water management. Mm -hmm. They want change. Doesn't seem like the government is ready to make any changes, any tweaks? Is there any common ground to be found there? Uh, respectfully, um, I, we just don't take that position. The, the land designation piece that you're referring to mm -hmm. in Bill C-45, the Budget Implementation Act, actually deals with a simplification of the process for leasing land, which provides First Nations with a new tool or a simpler tour, tool for leasing land for commercial and industrial development, whether that's a large scale, uh, scale resource project or big box stores on their reserve where they're bordering a city or town or small business center. That's what um, facilitates economic growth in those communities. So, so they, will, they will need to perhaps take this through the courts to see if there is anything in the way of traditional Aboriginal rights that would allow them more well, say. I'm not, not going to comment on the, on, the, on the potential for litigation. I can tell you that those specific clauses were in direct response okay. to First Nations communities who asked us to simplify a process that was painfully long and didn't act at what they'd asked for and that was to the ability to act at the speed of business and that's why, what that accomplishes. Why do you think this all boiled over in this past week as it did? Well, I, I think I think what has happened here is the the um, you have you know the the assembly of First Nations and their leaders uh, wanting to continue to build on a process that we started with the Crown First Nations gathering. We've seen the idle no more um, movement uh, express. Uh, how, to a certain extent, that the federal government feels we know that Aboriginal Canadians represent the most important part of the human resource piece of any resource development. 
Uh, we'd love numbers to improve on reserve with respect to employment and unemployment. To the extent Legi that there's legitimate dissatisfaction, grievances. legitimate grievances, to the extent that there's dissatisfaction with that, we share it. What we need to focus on are the tools and the policy platforms or the oversight committees, whatever uh, we're talking about, uh, but things that actually accomplish goals and deliver. So to that extent, um, I think that there's a good legacy here when we can replace placards with college diplomas, high school diplomas and, and tools to work in trades. I only have 15 seconds. Yeah. Uh, you sat in with the Prime Minister for, for, for four hours. Yeah. You've been working on this file for a long time. Yeah. Do you see a, a watershed change here? Is he genuinely ready to move forward with a little more speed, let's say? Well, I, I think in fairness, both the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs uh, and uh, under our Prime Minister's leadership have shown that particularly in the past year, we've made major developments and we're building on okay. those. This just simply suggests that a political, uh, the political machinery to oversee the progress uh, will be more right. substantial. And that's what we accomplished. That's what they asked for. Greg Rickford, thanks very much for being here. I appreciate this. Thank right. you.